Good afternoon, guys, and welcome to a, another episode of Costa Rica Real Estate and Investments, episode 81 with me, your host, Richard Bexon. Um, big shout out to everybody that's been in contact with us. Um, I've quite a few of you have reached out looking for advice, also seeing if we could help you as well. Uh, I think anybody that has reached out um, has probably not regretted it. We've given them probably too much information in, in some areas. Uh, and if, if, if not, um, then we have probably haven't done our job properly. But uh, again, I mean, our job really here is to kind of give you the information and the perspective that you need to make an informed decision, whatever that decision may be uh, here in Costa Rica. But anyway, if you want to contact us, you can info at investingcostarica.com. That's info at investingcostarica.com. So today we're going to be talking with Gary Wallace. Gary is the managing partner of the Serenity Hotel in Manuel Antonio. He's been in Costa Rica for over five and a half years. And during that time, uh, has successfully run a boutique hotel uh, in Manuel Antonio. So today we're going to be discussing with him kind of owning, owning, managing, and also buying a hotel in Costa Rica. I know we've been touching on the subject quite a while, uh, for quite a while, but I think it's important. It doesn't matter whether you're going to be doing a vacation rental or a hotel. Sometimes the uh, mechanisms and also the cost structures are very, very similar. But remember, if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out to us, info at investingcostarica.com. Uh, if you have any questions for Gary directly, all of his contact details will be in the description. Let's get straight into it, guys. Good afternoon, Gary. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you, Richard? Very, very, very good. I'm uh, taking a few days off before I go off to Guanacaste next week for the week. So, uh, it, so yeah. It doesn't look like you're taking a day off at all. Well, I mean, I'm taking a day off tomorrow and then Friday ah. and then Saturday. Well, I say I'm taking a day off. It's very difficult for me to take a day off just because I love what I do. So sometimes, you know, I make myself available for people that I work with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I love what it is that I do. So very yeah. fortunate. Exactly. Well, Gary, I gave you a bit of an intro there, uh, explaining to everybody kind of what it is that you do, how long you've been here in Costa Rica. But I, I really like, always like to kind of start the podcast uh, to kind of get an idea of like what people was, I mean, I suppose what's really surprised people over the past few months and also kind of what trends you may be seeing out there in Manuel Antonio, Gary. Um, well, I mean, the biggest surprise for everybody uh, was COVID. Um, yep. It disrupted everything, everything you can imagine, life, business, even relationships, it's, it's, it's been a tough couple of years. So that was the big surprise. Uh, but in terms of the business, the, um, the surprises for me when I started working with the hotel after we bought it was, you know, it's like the crazy uncle that comes to Christmas dinner that comes every year and he kind of, he, he's a little schizophrenic. Yep. And, and dealing with the Costa Rican government is like that in that there are certain aspects of dealing with them that they're very anal retentive. Yep. Um, uh, trying to get a business license, yep. uh, trying to get a bank account, um, moving money into the country, large sums of money into the country. Um, to give you an example, to open a bank account in Canada would probably take me 30 minutes if, it took, if there was a lineup. In Costa Rica, when I had to open a bank account after we bought the hotel, it took six weeks and a trip back to Canada because there were certain things that had to be brought in. Originals couldn't be copied, couldn't be emailed. Wow. And um, I mean, don't, this isn't the whole picture, but there are certain things about the way the government operates that are very time consuming, somewhat frustrating. And I think that if you look back to the root cause of these certain areas that are very tight, it goes back to the fact that Costa Rica does not want to be seen as supporting the uh, drug industry yep. uh, or illegal drug industry. So a lot of the bank laws and the government laws are to protect the country from bringing uh, money in, laundering money, yep. et cetera. And once well, you understand that, you can accept it a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you say that, Gary, just because, again, I spend a lot of time working with escrow companies. And the reason that we do that is just because trying to get money into the country sometimes, you know, can be a bit of a nightmare. So by using an escrow company uh, for whatever it may be, you know, they kind of somewhat clean is not the word, but like they approve the money coming through because they're registered, you know, they're with SUHEF, like our SEC here, so that they have done their due diligence, you know, on any money that they're accepting. So that makes things easier. But I mean, you've been in the, you know, in the hotel industry and especially in Manuel Antonio, but I mean, what trends have you seen after COVID that really kind of was like, wow, I didn't expect that to happen? Well, just before we go on to that, let me say there's been things that have surprised me in the easy sense too. Yep. Um, in some ways, after you get started, once you get established, once you get the money here and you get going, 
things are easy to do. I mean, I yep. decided to put a, I decided to add a deli to the bar I had here when it was COVID and only restaurants were allowed to open. Three weeks from beginning to end, finding somebody to do it, finding the materials, talking to the government people, getting my license, I was open three weeks later. It never amazing. happened, never happened anywhere else. So, you know, you got two sides of that coin. Um, in terms of trends, what I've seen, Richard, is um, remote working, more yeah. and more demand for people, whether they be nationals that are coming from San Jose to the coast for a weekend, or they're Canadians or Europeans, they're taking longer vacations. So that's another trend, but they're combining that with working on the road. Yep. So, for example, to meet that demand nine months ago, we put in a co-working space. Yep. Uh, that's isolated from the hotels, has its own air conditioning, has its own Wi-Fi, has a beautiful view over the pool, quiet, isolated, own TV, everything. And it's getting used more and more. So that's one of the, the trends that I've seen. Longer vacations. I, I mean, when I was a kid, which was way before when you were a kid, um, one week vacations, two weeks max, where they're like, nobody took longer than that. Now people are taking a month, six weeks, two two months, and they're finding a way to make it work in other countries, sometimes because they don't have a job that ties them down, sometimes because they're retired. I don't, it's it just, I'm seeing longer and longer stays as yeah. a theme. I, I wonder if that's here to stay, Gary. I mean, I, 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 my perspective is, you know, yes, it is. Uh, and I'm just seeing more and more of it. The more communications that I have, the more I, again, have conversations with people of, you know, they're looking to come down for a month, two months, sometimes really as like an exploratory mission, just because they just, you know, they want to move out of their country, whether that be from wherever it is. And Costa Rica is a great destination to do that. And to get residency here is not really, really difficult. Yeah, that's true. I have residency here. It, it takes time, but it's not difficult. Correct. You just right. need to have, again, you just need to have your paperwork in order. And sometimes that's a little difficult to put together, but but they don't make it onerous. They just make it Perfect. time consuming. Yeah. It's more than anything. The other trend I'm seeing, Richard, is more purpose driven holidays, which I would yep. call that's what I call it. People that come here to do something, whether it's to see a kit cell in the mountains and go bird watching or it's to hike the El Camino or it's to do volunteering in the interior. Um, there still is that core of take your family away, sit on a beach, relax and, and unwind. And that'll always be there. But there's more and more people that hook a purpose into their time away. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, acknowledging that and catering to those people is a key to the success, I think. Definitely, definitely. Well, I mean, you own and manage a hotel in Mamel Antonio, which, you know, Mamel Antonio I know very, very well, uh, having been in the travel industry for 17 years. You know, it's one of Costa Rica's top destinations. And I believe that Mamel Antonio is the number one visited national park. But if you had a time machine, Gary, to, to, to tell yourself something beforehand, you know, before you bought the hotel and invested in the hotel, what would you have told yourself or what would you have liked to have known? Um, well, I would have liked to have had a better handle on the laws and the taxes and how they work. But I don't think anyone goes into this, you know, reading up on the laws and the taxes. Yep. Um, the other thing would have been, I, I have a customer service background. I had it for 35 years, but I've never been in the hotel business per se. So there was a learning curve that was associated with that. So I would have liked to have known those things, but neither one of those is insurmountable. If you're, you're willing to listen to people and learn, you'll pick yep. it up. Well, I mean, what advice would you give anyone to looking to purchasing a hotel or investing in a hotel, Gary? Well, you hit on one already, Richard. Uh, we bought a hotel and I have a partner. We bought a hotel in Manuel Antonio. I mean, when somebody has a dream about this, their dream is they, they put together some money, they find a beautiful piece of a beach in some remote area, they build this luxurious place and they open and people beat a path to their door. Of course. It's a great dream and some people pull it off, but the reality is location, location, location is a cliche in this industry for good reason. Yep. Mamo Antonio and Capos have probably, maybe I'm even underestimating Richard, maybe 50 hotels if you count them from top to bottom. And you may say, oh my God, all that competition, how can you compete? It's actually the opposite. You have 50 hotels marketing the area. So you bring in a large flow and volume of people. And then you have to find your piece of that volume and bring them right. to you. 
Yep. You don't have to spend millions on marketing, which you might have to do if you're in, in a piece of the jungle that's beautiful, but nobody knows about it. Yep. Um, but location, location, location is a big deal. And uh, we specifically chose this location because we knew we wouldn't have to start from scratch. We built yep. a hotel that was already, was already built. And it's well known as being one of the places to come in the country. So now we just had to find our niche within that existing market rather than trying to create a market. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's great. You know, I'm, I'm doing a feasibility study for a client at the moment between building, you know, a beachfront uh, home in Playa Grande or a beachfront home in Tamarindo. And I'm like, look, guys, just because Tamarindo is, and I can see the demand. I mean, I'm even showing them the demand data. I'm just like, look, the demand is 10 times more, you know, and your ADR is going to be higher. Your average daily rate, your occupancy is going to be higher. Right. It may be more expensive to build, but your return is going to be quicker just because, again, right. it's location, 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 which means you're just riding on the coattails of everybody else marketing in the area as well. You know, yeah, security in numbers, right? Safety in numbers. Yeah. Well, plus also Expedia, TripAdvisor, all these other guys that are advertising the destinations, you know. So, I mean, it, it really is like a snowball effect once you, you know, right. once you get in a location. And I mean, I know hoteliers like Jim DeMarlis from Seacom on O in Manuel Antonio who opened Via Blanca and like he's taken his arrows in Via Blanca trying to create that destination. Right. Um, you know, and even the guys down in La Parios, you know, down in the, in the Osa Peninsula did when they first started. I mean, there are numerous, you know, Puntes Lita. I mean, there are numerous hotels in this country where they've tried to create a destination. And, 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 and a, you just need to have time and money. And there's a saying, and it applies here as, as it does in many other things. The pioneers get the arrows, the right. settlers get the land. Yep, yep, 100%. The other thing, the other, um, you asked me what advice I would give, um, get a good professional team around you, especially if this isn't your native country. Yep. Uh, get, uh, you know, get a good real estate broker. And when I say get a good one, look for references. Start, start by talking to you, if if that's your area of expertise. Talk to somebody who knows the country and knows the lay of the land. Do not get a sit uh, a group of professionals around you that you don't know that well. They have to be spoken for. So I would say get a good real estate broker, get a very good lawyer. They'll keep you out of trouble. The real estate broker will keep you out of trouble. And if you can afford it, I would I would say get an advisor. Somebody like yourself, here you go, Richard, free plug. Thank, thank somebody, you, Gary. Yeah, somebody like yourself that's made the mistakes or learned through making mistakes or maybe not making mistakes, because mistakes, when you're buying a hotel or buying commercial real estate can be very, very expensive. Yes. And although the cost of getting good professionals around, the temptation is, you know, I'll save 20% by taking this lawyer over that lawyer. You may pay 10 times that if there's a mistake made. So you really have to be careful about that. Yeah. Um, the other thing, the other two things I'd mentioned advice, uh, determine early what your, your corporate structure is gonna be. Um, and sort of have that known by the team so they can build the solution that you're trying to put together around the, corporates, the corporate solution. Is it a solely owned? Is it a corporation owned by a corporation? Is there a Costa Rican corporation? Is it owned yeah. offshore? It sounds like the mundane part of the deal, but it becomes very important in the end. And if you change your if you change your direction at the end, it can be very costly. Yeah. So you have to. I, the I agree. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, my advice for people is always hold the asset in one company as well, and then have the management company in the other. You know, yep. um, just separate concerns. I mean, it's very simple, but again, unless you've, as I always like to say, unless you've tre you've tread on that landmine, you don't really know. So, um, but no, I mean, I think that that corporate structure and also the structure for tax as well. You know, not exactly. so much today, but also at some point in the future if you exit. Yes, capital gains. You have to think about you have to think about the whole life cycle of the investment, yep. not yep. just oh great, I bought a hotel. Mm -hmm. This is going to be so amazing. Unfortunately. To do it well, you have to think it through. And that's why that's where an advisor or a good lawyer can can help you help think about these things, questions you may not think of yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many facets to um, you know, to, to running a hotel from operations to inventory to like if you have a restaurant, like there's a lot more moving parts there, you know, to sales and marketing, to your tax structures, to you know, customer service, front debt. I mean, it's just, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, but I mean, I think the one thing I always say to people is this, look, it's a great industry. Why? Because you get to see people at their best. And when I say their best, they're most relaxed. You know, they don't have their business hats on. There's no facade they're putting on. Like they're just relaxed. They're at like, 
they're just real. Totally agree. I mean, lifestyle choice, this is the best choice I've made in my life. Um, so yeah, I love it here. I love what I'm doing. I love the country. My, my home base now is Costa Rica. It used to be Canada. Now I visit Canada. I vacation in Canada. I live in Costa Rica. And that, yeah. that's fine by me. Yeah, hey, I'm the same. You know, I vacation back to the the UK, but like Costa Rica's home. I'm getting my citizenship here now. You know, someone's like, someone asked me today in an Uber that was just like, why did it take you 17 years to get citizenship? And I was like, well, it wasn't until I really was like, you know what, I should probably start voting to a country, you know, um, now, uh, you know, I haven't been here so long and have a say in kind of somewhat its future. I was like, I'm probably going to need citizenship. Very good. So. I mean, let's because I speak to quite a few people that are looking to buy, you know, properties here, either build, a, you know, a hotel or, you know, buy one. I mean, I think the preference always is just buy one, because, again, with all the, as you mentioned there, you know, the bureaucracy to go through. But what questions do you think people should be asking, you know, potentially a current owner of a hotel uh, if they're looking to buy one? Um, well, some of this is pretty obvious, but I'll, I'll run down a few questions that I would think of you. You, you want to have a really good building inspection. Yep. Um, you want what we call good bones. I mean, there's always going to be some superficial things that are going to be a problem or haven't been looked after. They can be dealt with. But as long as the bones of the hotel are good, um, the septic is good, the, uh, the, the, corp the, the integrity of the structure itself is good, um, your uh, infrastructure inside, your plumbing is good, because those are expensive things to address. Yep. But, you know, get that looked at and get a, if you can't do it yourself, get it looked at by a professional. Um, obviously, how how is the hotel today getting their guests? How are they locating them? Are they just going booking and Airbnb and that's the full extent? Well, that's an opportunity for you as a buyer if that's all they're doing, because there's so many more options to be able to get guests into your hotel. If they're just using the easy way. Then with a little bit of work, you can add all the elements to that and increase your occupancy easily. So you want to know how, how effective they've been in getting their guests. I would ask to review the books. Uh, that, can be an interesting, uh, that can be an interesting exercise in Costa Rica. Um, but yeah, you need to look at the books and then try to determine how real they are and what's real inside of them, especially the expense side. Um, how, how well have they been controlling the expenses? I mean, if they're still in business, they're probably kept controlling the cash flow, but how well have they been controlling the expenses? If you see things in there that are easily taken out, then there's another opportunity for it to make profit easily. Taking expense out drops right to the bottom line. Yep. So look at the books, look at the expense side, especially well. Um, and financing. I'd ask around financing. If you're an offshore person trying to buy a hotel, uh, In-country financing is going to be, if not difficult, impossible. Um, financial institutions within Costa Rica very rarely lend money to somebody who doesn't have a life here and have assets here. Yep. So you have to understand how you're going to do your financing. One of the most effective ways to do it is to do a vendor take back mortgage from the existing owner. Yep. So that'd be one of the things I would investigate right up front. And... You may feel you have enough money to buy it, but it may be more cost effective to borrow some of it back from the vendor and leave some money as a rainy day fund. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that wish they did that on March 2020. Yes. Yeah. So um, those are the things that I would look. Those are the questions I would go at. Well, I mean, you mentioned there about expenses, but I mean, what about how you value a hotel? Because, you know, I, we had a conversation a while back uh, with Joshua Whitman. He works for Remax and we discussed it a little bit, but like there are so many options to valuing a hotel. And I always say, Ultimately, a value of anything is what someone's willing to pay for it. But like, right. how do you go by getting a benchmark? Or how would you go about getting a benchmark? Well, I mean, traditionally, whether it's residential real estate or commercial real estate, the first thing you look at is the comparables. How yeah. does this compare with the hotel down the street? How does it compare with the hotel in the next town that you're looking at? And there's a number of standard ways that are usually looked at that you can do the comparables on. Uh, EBITDA. Um, yep. A multiple of the profit, take yep. the profit times some multiple, and that's what the, what the, the value should be. Uh, percentage return on investment, another way you can value the hotel. It makes 50000 a year, 10 times means it's worth half a million, that type of thing. Yep. And then um, there's the, uh, the room key exercise, which says, 
standard comparables in this area is uh, a hotel should be worth $90,000 per key, which is per rentable room. Um, now of all those, most of them don't work today because we've gone through two horrible years. Most hotels cannot show you a track record that's more than two years old. That's anything that you can actually use as a measuring stick. So we have our hotel up for sale right now, Serenity, and we're going through that life cycle and we've done a room key exercise to value it. It allows somebody with, with a, a financial background or without even a financial background, very easy to understand the room key per dollar. Yep. And they can compare that to the hotel down the street or something else. If they want to get into other measurements, we can support those measurements and get into it afterwards. But to get them interested and to show it that you're right in the where you should be in the market, uh, a dollar prep value per room key is usually the easiest way to get into it. And that's what we've chosen at the, on this particular exercise. Okay. Well, I mean, I think it's good for listeners to understand that you, again, you know, it's that you're for, you are for sale because I think anyone that is looking to buy a hotel should definitely look at, as you said there, location, location, location. Mammal Antonio has all of that, you know, and it's, you know, our travel business sends a lot of money to Mammal Antonio, a lot of money, and it's not slowing down. You know, it's, it's going quite the opposite. Uh, and I think what's going to happen in Mammal Antonio is it's going to see another renaissance. And I mean, from the area of people coming in and buying hotels and doing them up, you know, uh, you've got Jungle Vista just down the road there that was, you know, bought by the guys over at Los Altos has been doing up. You know, I know yep. that the guys at Arenas del Mar are redoing some of their beachfront stuff. You know, Si Como No has a new management team. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening in the area. And I think Mamon Antonio has a very strong and prosperous future. Yeah, and there's lots of selection and lots of, lots of peers that you can look at and learn from. And I mean, yep. you mentioned Jim uh, from Si Como No. Uh, he's become a personal friend of mine through your through your interview. I, I watched his interview and reached out to him. And uh, we get together every, probably every month, compare notes, compare frustrations, look at possible solutions to problems. So um, it's part of it. It's part of the whole plan that you should look at. And yes, you're yeah. right. I think Manuel Antonio is going to see another renaissance. And there's not there's not an abundance of land to build on here anymore. No, there's not. It's very vertical land off the water. And when you go in a little bit, so you know what they say, you know, they're invest in land. They're not making anymore. Very, very true. Very, very true. Well, I mean, I'm going to put all your contact details in the description. So I think anybody that wants to reach out to you to discuss, you know, uh, the hotel uh, can do. But I mean, what other sources of revenue do you think people should look at when running a hotel beyond just, you know, the room revenue? Well, I can only speak to what we've done. And um, we had some a ground floor space that wasn't being used very effectively. So we turned that into a bar. Yep. And um, thank God for the bar, because in the, the depths of COVID-19, the bar was making a lot more than the hotel was. Yep. Because people may be afraid of a pandemic, but they still like to have a drink once or twice a week. Um, and then when they shut down the bars, if you recall, they yep. said, well, restaurants can still stay open, so they have to eat. That's when I put a deli in in three weeks and up, we're, we're a restaurant now. So those have done really well for us. Um, the other thing that is maybe a little bit different uh, for a revenue stream is I, in understanding my clientele, the people that live in the area, there's a, there's a high concentration of expats, retirees, uh, people that live here that, that needed and wanted something to break the routine. So what we started doing is events. Uh, we would do cooking events, a cook-off, a chili cook-off, uh, a Bloody Mary Sunday morning, who can make the okay. best Bloody Mary, uh, a cornhole tournament for charity. Uh, one month ago, we did a poker run and brought in some motorcycle folks from all around the country came into it. And um, surprisingly, they can be pretty nice revenue generators because even if you do it for charity, You've got the place, people in your location, they're gonna eat, they're gonna drink, and it's gonna be a good day, uh, you know, all around. So um, I think those are the type of things, know your customer, uh, leverage your location, and uh, look what potential you have within the building or within the grounds to, to make more money out of it. That would be my advice in that regard. Gary, what's your favorite place to go in Costa Rica that's a little bit off the beaten track? I always like to ask people this, because it's, you know, people that live here, you know, you have some peculiar ones sometimes. Um, well, I don't think this is very peculiar and I don't know how off the beaten track it really is, but I've been 
even before we bought the hotel, I'd been here a dozen times. And I, there's one place in particular I've been to probably 20 times, and that's uh, Montezuma, yep. uh, at the very tip of uh, the Nicoya Peninsula. Beautiful. And the first, the first time I went there was, I'm going to guess it was 30 years ago, Richard. Wow. And I, don't, I don't think it's changed that much in 30 years, which for me is part of the beauty of it. There's no room for a hotel. There's, there's no traffic lights. Everyone walks around barefoot. It's just the most bohemian laid back atmosphere that I think I've found in the country. So that when my partner and I want to get away for a weekend or a week or something, we just motor up to Punta Arenas, take the ferry across and disappear into Montezuma. We love it there. It's a beautiful part of the country. And I mean, it's amazing it hasn't kicked off a little bit more, but I know why it hasn't, because just the water infrastructure there by Delicias and then over to Cabuya and those areas, you know, it's just not, is not really heavy there. I mean, I just helped a client basically, unfortunately, they didn't close on a piece of property because they couldn't get their water from a well that they were digging. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it just comes down to water. And I don't think people really understand that sometimes. It's just like, look, if you don't have legal water, you can't do anything. Yes, and, and the rules, as you pointed out, the rules around that have changed over the years. And yep. that's why one of the reasons you have an advisor, they'll, they'll tell you before you get too deep into a, into a potential purchase, you better check these things off. Here's your checklist, make sure they're there. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing with that was that I, I structured the deal that again, if they didn't have water, uh, that they would be able to back out of it. So instead of no, losing, you know, close to a million dollars. Unfortunately, they lost, you know, $15,000 drilling a well, but better to lose 15 than, you know, a million. That's right. Absolutely. So, and that's a great escape clause. But yep. there's so many of them. There's, there's, a, you know, uh, opt outs around titling, around water, yep. around services, around, you know, working septics and room to put in another one if you need one. Yep. You know, I, I can't list them off. But a good advisor would take you to keep you out Definitely. of trouble. Definitely. Well, my last question for you, Gary, is if you inherited $500,000 and had to invest it into a business or real estate in Costa Rica, what would you do with it? I have to invest it, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I would look for an opportunity to invest in what I think is a really up and coming trend, which is fractional ownership. Yep. Um, better known by its evil twin timeshare, which got a bad reputation probably in the 70s or 80s because of some very unscrupulous you know business practices around the world but fractional ownership when it's done correctly uh, can be a great investment and and a great opportunity for somebody to have a bolt hole somewhere else in the world costa rica that they can go to and they know that it's not it's always going to be there for them because they're part owner of it i think the uh, the graying of the the G7 populations, uh, the more disposable income they have, combined with the unsettled political and economic situations in some of those countries, mean that people are looking for a place to go to hide out from the, the chaos. Yep. And um, Costa Rica is seen as a haven that way. No army, you know, peaceful, safe, you know, beautiful weather. So, you know, I think fractional ownership is going to come through another renaissance as well. well I mean, and, I'm starting to see a little bit of it, Gary, in the market. Yeah. You know, I'm starting to see a little bit because, again, it's, it's basically, it's like a timeshare, but you own an asset and you ride that appreciation of the asset. Whereas a timeshare, you don't. Usually it's 20 years and you pay your money right. and then you're done, you know. Right. Um, it's very similar. I worked, I structured a, what, a tourism bond. Uh, which was basically an investment into a bond that also gave you a time share at a particular property, meaning that you would get an annual return. You'd also get two weeks at the property. And also at the end of the bonds life cycle, you get your original investment back. Right. You know, I mean, not to get into the complications of like legal, you know, of structuring a financial instrument there, but it was just interesting how now a lot of people are looking for that lifestyle element of a of an investment. Absolutely. And I would be looking for... <clears throat> Um, 500,000 wouldn't be enough to really purchase a, a going thing, but in a partnership, it probably would be. I'd be looking for multiple units, all separate with a good common area yep. uh, that can be shared. And a lot of hotels don't have great common areas. So it might be a different, it might be a different layout than a, than a standard hotel, but yep. a hotel with good common areas, or I mean, multiple units with good common areas 
that can be divided up and, uh, and done as a uh, fractional ownership. I think marketed correctly, run by a smart, good marketing team, I think that would do very well. I agree, I agree. Well, Gary, I really appreciate your time and coming on here. I think this has been very useful for anyone that's looking to invest in Costa Rica, that's looking to buy a hotel. I mean, as Gary mentioned, his hotel is for sale um, and all of his contact details will be in the description down below. But Gary, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Richard, I, I appreciate being on your show. You've, I've been following you for about a year and you've had the who's who of real estate and investment in this country on your show. And uh, yeah, I, I respect the fact that you asked me to come on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Pro Vida. Guys, another great interview there with Gary Wallace. Uh, as you can see there, Gary has a lot of experience in, uh, I suppose, investing and also running and, operate, well, running and operating a, a hotel here in Costa Rica, uh, especially somewhere like Mamon Antonio. I mean, really, you know, I mean, as he mentioned there, a lot of the time it's location, location, location and creating your own destination. Um, you know, it's, it can take time. Uh, it's not, you know, undoable. It can just take time. And I think there are certain things you can do, certain things I've definitely seen, um, you know, that you can, you can do to help your chances. But uh, again, anyone that wants to get in contact with us, they can info at investingcostarica.com. That's investingcostarica.com. Uh, I'll not talk on, I'm actually thinking at the moment whether I should do some form of kind of live seminar so that a bunch of people can get on here and we'll have some guests on here, uh, you know, some speakers, uh, authorities in Costa Rica and see if they can answer some questions. So I think if anybody thinks that we should do that, feel free to just send me a quick email. Uh, and if there's anything in particular they think that we should discuss, uh, we'll do that. It's been kind of rattling around in my brain for a while now. Uh, just again, it's just sometimes finding the time to do this stuff. But I think it's time that we, we had a seminar, uh, you know, of 30 minutes to an hour where we just get some people on here and we can just kind of talk and answer some questions of, uh, that you guys have. So, but anyway, if uh, I really appreciate your time, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, remember to give us uh, some, some, uh, some thumbs up, some, some five stars um, and uh, have a great day, guys. Bye.